Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out his plan for us. So welcome to church. see you here today for worship. Let's start with a call to worship from Psalm 95. This is Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let's worship. Mm -hmm. opportunity to worship you. And we know that we do so not through our own righteousness, but through Christ's righteousness. We ask that you would forgive us and cleanse us of our rebellion towards you. We ask for your help in losing our fear of not being in control. And give us the faith and trust to hand our fear and our love of control over to you the only one with the power to bring us true peace. Now let's read a scripture from Romans 8, verse 15 through 17. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. It is that very spirit, spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. 
and of children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified.
18, 1 through 4. Luke tells us that after Paul arrived in Corinth, he soon met Priscilla and Aquila, fellow tent makers who had been deported from Rome by Emperor Claudius. According to first century records, Claudius tried to rid Rome of Judeans and Christians in about 49 AD. Now Paul and his new friends may have sold their tents right here, this location, in what would have been shops at the western side of the Forum. Paul also followed his normal custom of going to the synagogue to preach the gospel. Well, praise God. I'm sure you can tell that our frontline team is not here today. They're in Maine, and so uh, we're on a skeleton crew today, but thank God for the help that we've had, and we got it done, and uh, we're happy to welcome you. I hope that you enjoyed the worship and that you might have got a little something out of the history lesson. Before we go to the book of Corinthians, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. I, I want to uh, sing happy birthday. Joel is here helping us uh, this morning, and so we want to sing happy birthday to Joel. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Joel. Happy birthday to you, we love you, we do, we love you, we do, we love you, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Come here, Joe, stand up here. You might be able to be seen if you stand on the little pulpit right here. Right here, get up on that. All right, now let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Joel. We pray right now that you give him a blessed year and that you give him a good birthday as he celebrates it this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Joel. Praise God. I also want to uh, congratulate my wife for putting up with me for 48 years. I'm not easy to put up with. <laughs> uh, God sure did break the mold uh, when he made Debbie and blessed uh, my life with her. We want to pray for a couple of things uh, this morning. Uh, so I ask you to join me in prayer. Lord, we pray for Cambodia that you'd help the fields, Lord, that we prayed for rain to now dry up, let, let some of this water uh, dry up, let the fields not be so wet, Lord. We thank you for answering prayer and giving rain, but now we, we need, Lord, to, to get a little bit more uh, of the water to move on. And so we just pray that you'll help that to do that, Lord. We pray, Lord, for healing uh, for many people, Lord, that we've been lifting up to you. We ask you, Lord, to touch uh, Sister Mary, uh, who is struggling, Lord, with the cancer. We pray, Lord, for wisdom, for direction, and for jobs, Lord, for people. Lord, those that are in need this morning, we ask you, Lord, to send help. We pray for Sister Debbie's hand, Lord. She uh, worked with those apples the other day, so many apples peeling them and everything. Now, now her hand hurts, Lord, so we just pray that you relieve the pain from her hand, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers, Lord. The many prayers that we have given to you, Lord, we thank you for answering them. And we just continue to seek your face, Lord, in the, all these needs and in all these areas, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Amen. I received a text the other night from a gentleman that we've been praying for, and he wanted to tell me, thank all the people for their prayers, because he had been without a job for quite a long time, and one of the problems was making sure that he was cleared. Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, depending on the particular type of job that you have, you have to get a clearance or you have to get a background check or sometimes you have to get multiples. And so the particular place he was applying to work for, uh, he had to get these special clearances. And it just took longer and longer, possibly because of COVID, possibly because of just uh, paperwork or whatever. But he texted me the other night and he said, Terry, I want you to thank all the people for praying for me. I got the job that I wanted. I got the job that I've been applying for. It finally came open. I finally was hired, so thank everybody. He said, and thank the Lord, I'm getting $20 an hour at this job, and I really needed it. So uh, we just want to thank God for answering our brother's prayers, and we want to thank you for praying with us for him and for his situation. You know, sometimes we don't, uh, we might pray and we don't see an answer or we don't hear an answer. And so, you know, we kind of wonder, well, was that prayer worth it? It's, it's times like these that we realize that that prayer was worth it and that prayer was important. So if God answers your prayer, if God answers a prayer that we have prayed with you about, please let us know so we can share it with the other people that are praying. That, that keeps us excited and keeps us in, in line with what God wants us to do, to be praying for one another. It's important to pray for one another. But, you know, you, you can get, as one friend told me this morning, he said, Terry, I'm just tired. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just tired. I don't, I don't have any other way to express it. I'm just tired. And, you know, that, that is a true statement. Uh, life can sometimes tire us out. And so we just want to encourage you to keep uh, on the things of the Lord. Pray for our uh, Royal Rangers. Pray for our Girls Club. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Pray for, pray for the church and the church people, the members, those that are not able to come here uh, because of this COVID. Just keep them in your prayers. And we want to thank all of you that are continuing to send your offerings and support the church. Thank you very much. We could not do it without you. So we, we just want you to know we appreciate you. Tune in with us Wednesday night for Pastor Connects. We look forward to being with you each Wednesday. <clears throat> so please tune back with us at 7.30 Wednesday night. If you have your Bibles... Wednesday night I talked about the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians and tonight, or today, excuse me, this morning here I'm going to talk about 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, so if you want to read along with me, and as I said before, I may be reading it in a translation that you're not familiar with, so just bear with us. Because I read it sometimes in a lot of different translations. Because I want to get a, a deeper or a clearer understanding of it. This morning I'm reading 6 and 1. It says, Furthermore, how dare you take a believer to court? It is wrong to drag him before the unrighteous to settle a legal dispute. Isn't it better to take him before God's holy believers to settle the matter? Don't you realize that we, the holy ones, will judge the universe? If the unbelieving world is under your jurisdiction, you should be fully confident to settle these trivial lawsuits among yourself. For surely you know that we will one day judge angels, let alone these everyday matters. Don't you realize that you are bringing your issues before civil Judges appointed by people who have no standing within the church. What a shame that there is not one within the church who has a spirit of wisdom 
who can arbitrate these disputes and reconcile the offended parties. <clears throat> is it, it is not right for a believer to sue a fellow believer, especially to bring them before unbelievers. Now somebody might wonder, well, why in the world uh, did Paul write this? And then you might wonder, well, why in the world are we even talking about it? What does that have to do with us? Well, let me, let me just give you a little insight. When I was younger, I read this scripture, and without fully understanding its meaning, I took it to mean that you couldn't sue anybody. I took it to mean that as a believer, you can never go to court. However, if you really look at this scripture deeply, what Paul is talking about is that when there is a dispute among two Christian people, those Christian people should be able to bring it to the church and find a solution unless they can find it among themselves, and that's fine too. But if, there, if it will not be solved any other way, they should bring it to the church and let the church decide. Now, how many of you would know any situation in life where you have seen that a person would bring that situation to the church and let, that ch let the church decide it? Most of the times we don't do that. Most of the times we either don't talk to them anymore or we don't have any relationship with them anymore or we move to a different church or whatever, but we don't really get it settled. And that, that is one of the things that if, if you could find criticism about the church is that we do not handle our affairs very well. We have thousands upon thousands of denominations and churches and everything, but we cannot handle the little disputes between believers. What Paul is saying is that if you have a dispute against a believer, the church should deal with it. He's not referring to any disputes that you might have with an unbeliever. And therefore, that's appropriate to take that to court. That's appropriate when you have to deal with that. So it's important that we clearly understand what Paul is talking about and not mix it all up. And then he goes on and he says in verse 7, Don't you realize that when you drag another believer into court, you're providing evidence that you're already defeated? In other words, he's saying that when you, when you take it to court against a believer, you're saying that you can't work it out. You're not mature enough to deal with it. And then he goes even a step further, and this is a step where Christians really should uh, ask themselves, Have I done this? Can I do this? Wouldn't it be better to accept the fact that someone is trying to cheat you and take advantage of you and simply choose the high road? In other words, as a believer, wouldn't it be better to let your other believing brother or sister just do whatever they're going to do and just not let it bother you? Just accept it and go on? Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that be the Christian thing? In fact, the definition of that is turn the other cheek. That's what the, the, the definition is. Just go ahead and turn the other cheek. At times it is better to accept injustice and even to let somebody take advantage of you rather than to expose our conflicts publicly before unbelievers. It's wrong for us to let unbelievers see that we're fighting. <coughs> it's wrong for us to let unbelievers see that we can't grow up and that we can't be mature. They might look at us and say, What's the point of being a Christian? They can't even get along. What's the point of being a Christian? They can't work out problems. They have to go to court. They have to take it to, to unbelievers to get it settled. But instead, you keep cheating and doing wrong to your brothers and sisters and then request that unbelievers render the judgment. Not good. I think it would be absolutely amazing if the church could actually live the way the church should live. But in reality, <clears throat> there are a lot of things in our own lives and in our own relationships that we just don't do and we just don't follow. Even though the Word of God might say it, we just don't do it. We choose instead to, to be selfish or we choose instead to get our own way or we choose instead I'll show them. I'll show them. You know, Matthew 18 tells you how to deal with church discipline. And yet churches do not discipline. 
As I said on Wednesday night, it, 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 seeing a pers person kicked out of the church today would be like, people would go, what? Did that really happen? Because we, just, we don't even follow what the Word of God says. I had a lady send me a text the other day and said, Pastor, I don't believe in church membership. I don't believe in denominations. And I said, well, then please answer this question to me. The Bible says that the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Now, how did anybody know that they were being added if nobody was keeping count? If nobody was writing down that this person has now become a part of the church, if nobody was recognizing that they were joining the fellowship, how would anybody know that anybody was being added? And later the Bible says, and the church multiplied. How would you know that the church was multiplying if nobody was joining any fellowship or any body of believers? You see, we have a lot of Christian long rangers. They want to do their own thing. They want to be their own authority. They want to be their own decision maker. They don't want anyone to have any influence or any authority over their life. And so in America, you can do this. In fact, one of the things that has been detrimental to the church is that in America, because we're so free, and thank God for freedom, <coughs> but in America, if you don't like something, if you don't like what another church is doing or what another pastor is doing, you can just go open your own church and be the pastor yourself. You don't need anyone else. And we have a lot of churches in our world that were, were started because people were selfish and wanted their own way. And they were not inspired by God. And they were not started by God. And that's a whole other story and people probably turned me off right there and that's okay. <laughs> Verse 9 says, Surely you must know that people who practice evil cannot possess God's kingdom's realm. Stop being deceived. There's some people in the church that are deceived. We have an ignorance in the, uh, and a famine in the church world. And the famine and the ignorance is of God's word. We do not understand it. We do not know uh, why it was written. We don't even know what it says for the most part. Many Christians have never read the Bible. Or if they have, they say, well, I don't understand what it says. Did you know that that is one of the purposes of God establishing the apostles? evangelists, pastors, teachers, prophets. Do you know that's one of the reasons that God established that in the church as actual gifts to the kingdom of God? Because they're, they're there to help us understand what we do not understand. And yet, we don't take advantage of it. People who continue to engage in sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, sexual perversion, homosexuality, fraud, greed, drunkenness, verbal abuse, or extortion, these will not inherit the kingdom realm. They will not inherit God's kingdom. Isn't it amazing that these kind of things actually take place within the church? You would think that the divorce rate would be very low among believers. It should be. Why is it not? Because people do not obey God's word. They think, well, you know, God's grace is, is, is sufficient, and it is. But it, Paul said, don't use it as an excuse. Don't use God's grace as an excuse to do your wrong. Don't take advantage of God's grace. So it's true that some of you have lived in those lifestyles, Paul says, but now you have been purified from the sin. So you've been set free. You've actually been forgiven. And so now go live like it. You've give, been given a perfect stand be, before God, all because of the power of the name of Jesus, the Messiah, and through our union with the Spirit of our God. <clears throat> How many people have said, you've heard them say, but the Spirit told me to do this? Hmm. I heard the other day that a person that's running for an office 
when they were asked, why did you decide to run for this office? They said, God told me to run. My question to that person, I haven't asked them yet, but my question as I was thinking about it, how are you going to respond if you lose? And God told you to do this. In your mind, you said God told you to do this. If God told you to do it, I'm not saying he did, I'm not saying he didn't, I don't know. But if God told you to do it and you don't win, are you going to be gracious about it and say, well, God must have told me this reason, you know, he must have wanted me to do this for some other reason, because I lost. Instead, some people will probably say, I don't understand why I didn't win. God told me to do it. Well, maybe he told you to do it, but he didn't tell you we were going to win. You see, so many people think that God told them to do things, but they don't have the correct response when it doesn't work out the way they thought God wanted it to work out. It's true that our freedom allows us to do anything, but that doesn't mean that everything we do is good for us. You might have the ability to do whatever. God may have given you freedom to do everything, but it may not be good for you. It might be something that will actually hinder you or hurt you. And so you should really seek the Lord. Seek the Spirit's direction in it and follow that. I'm free to do as I choose, but I choose to never be enslaved to anything. Never. To be completely free as a believer, Paul said. Not to be enslaved to anything. Some have said, I eat to live and I live to eat. But God will do away with all those things. The body was not created for illicit sex, but to serve and worship the Lord, who can fill the body with himself. Now the God who raised up our Lord Jesus from the grave will, awake, will awaken and rise us up through his mighty power. <coughs> it's true. Every single day we need God and we need his power. We need his help. We need his direction every single day. Even to live by the Spirit and to live according to these words that we've been reading here this morning, we need God's help. We can't do it without him. And as I've said before, it's one thing to say, Lord, help me and struggle with that and ask God for help and for prayer. And it's another thing to say, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm, just not, I'm going to do what I want to do. The one is seeking God's help and seeking God's direction. The other one is just doing your own thing. Doing your own thing, my brother and sister, will not be blessed. God will not bless that. Then the word goes on in verse 15 and says, Don't you know that your bodies belong to Christ? How many of you ever really realized that you don't belong to yourself? Years ago, when I was reading the book, How to Live Like a King's Kid, Harold Hill said in there that he walked down the hospital uh, hall praying that God would heal his daughter. And God spoke to his spirit and said, if she's your daughter, you heal her. And he backed up and he said, Lord, thank you for reminding me that she doesn't belong to me. She's your daughter. So, Lord, heal your daughter. And his daughter was healed. Listen, we need to recognize that we don't belong to ourselves. Our lives belong to God. He can do whatever he wants with them. He can lead us in whatever way he wants to. And hopefully, we'll go willingly. I saw someone post the other day about the footsteps. And they said, you know, wherever the footsteps are, that's where I was carrying you. And wherever those long streaks were, that's when I was dragging you. For some people, God has to drag them. It's the only way you can get them to go, because they won't go without any other uh, effort. So he must drag them. Remember, you belong to God. Should one presume to take the members of Christ's body and make them into members of a harlot? Absolutely not. Aren't you aware of the fact that when anyone sleeps with a prostitute, he becomes part of her, and she becomes part of him? For it has been declared 
the two become a single body. Now let's just stop for just a moment and just imagine why would Paul address the Corinthian churches about this? Believers, Christian believers in Corinth are still participating in the public thing that they always did before they were Christians. They still visit prostitutes. Oh yes, they come to church and they pray and they sing and they worship God, but they also go to prostitutes. And Paul tells them, don't you realize that when you do this, you're joining the body of Christ, the body that belongs to the Lord. You're joining it with sin. That's a serious thing for us to consider, that we would be careful what we do so that we do not join our lives and our bodies with sin. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is mingled into one spirit with him. This is why you must keep running away from the sexual immorality. As a Christian, am I going to be free from the temptations of sin? No. But Paul tells us here that the response is to run away from it. For every other sin a person commits is external to the body. But immorality involves sinning against your own body. <coughs> so, you need to be careful because when you sin in a, in a sinful way, it's a sin against your own body. Have you forgotten that your body is now the sacred temple of the Holy Spirit of holiness who lives in you? You belong or you don't belong to yourself any longer. For the gift of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside your sanctuary and you are God's expensive purchase, paid for with the tears of blood. So by all means, use your body to bring God glory. The other day I read an article, and this article was about a policeman. The policeman had a relative who passed away. And that morning on the way to work, he was somewhat distraught by the fact that a relative had died. He went into a store and tried to encourage himself through all of the trouble that he was dealing with. And in the process, he paid for somebody's food and <clears throat> told them that he wanted to pay it forward. The person behind him said, no, I'm paying for yours. And they kind of argued over who would pay. It was finally decided that they would pay for each other's and then they would pay for people around them because they wanted to give. They were in the mood of giving. Later that day, when the police officer went to work, he had a confrontation with somebody. And he hurt the person. Those that know him know he's not normally like that. And they said, you know, he may have, he may have had too much pressure on himself from the loss of the loved one. And asked for everyone to pray for him. To pray for him because of the struggle he was going through. He wanted as a Christian and as a believer and as a policeman to bring glory to God with his own life and his own body. It's a struggle sometimes to do that. The forces that be in the world, the, the, the things that we're going through, the difficulties, all these things weigh heavy on us. But if we persevere, if we continue to keep in mind that the reason I'm living today, I'm living to bring glory to God. I want to bring glory to God. And so I will persevere through all of the struggles and through all the temptations and through all the trials. Remember, God will give you strength. God will give you help and he will carry you through. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to delve into your word. 
We ask you, Lord, that you would provide for us spiritual understanding. For it is through your word that we understand all things. It's through your word that we come to the full knowledge. Lord, help us to grow up in grace, to grow up in the word, and help us to live the word. Father God, we pray for those that are struggling today, that are striving today, those that are having a hard time living for God. We pray, Lord, that you'd give them extra special help today and grace today. Lord, we pray that all who are listening to us today will find renewed strength and renewed courage as they seek to please you with their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we thank you again for joining us, and we pray that in some way this has been a blessing to you and has encouraged you, and we pray that you will continue in your walk with the Lord as you draw closer to Him. We hope to see you Wednesday, and I pray that your week is blessed and that you bring God glory this week. God bless you.